Swadika, hello and welcome to ASEAN Challenge, the show to give you the latest headlines, hot topics and updates happening around your ASEAN community in two languages, Thai and English. I'm Rosalind Tepawan. And I'm Alisa Siti Wong. Khao tan rap kun pu chong tuk tan khao su rai kan ASEAN Challenge ka. Khao san rap ASEAN pasa angkrit la pasa Thai. And to kickstart our show, let's take a look at what's happening in the retail industry, but not just any part of retail, but Fast food chains all around ASEAN, as the countries are developing even more, a lot more presence of fast food restaurants are actually showing up around our ASEAN community. And taking a look, especially at what's going on in Vietnam, it seems that the country itself is actually welcoming more and more compared to the rest of ASEAN. That's right. So for most of you, of course, we all know what McDonald's is. Most of us has probably had McDonald's before as well. But however, in Vietnam, McDonald's. It's not a brand that you can find so easily. Now, in Ho Chi Minh City, however, they're going to be opening their first McDonald's there. So that's good news for those of you who enjoy fast food, would like some burgers and fries. McDonald's will be opened in Ho Chi Minh, hopefully uh, within this month. So that's when you'll be able to enjoy McDonald's. So far, let's take a look at the breakdown really quickly. What's going on at McDonald's current presence in Vietnam, which is a very young country. And so with a young country full of, say, 35% millennials, according to reports, they say that millennials will be the target for hiring and the, the target for expanding McDonald's in all of Vietnam. But altogether, so far, there are lots of, you could say, branches already so far in Vietnam. Taking a look at Ho Chi Minh City, there are a few already, it seems, about eight branches altogether, it seems. Well, looks like it, there's room for expansion, right? That's right. So a second ago, I said that it was going to open in Ho Chi Minh. I meant Hanoi, actually. So that's where McDonald's will be opening within this month. And they plan to employ approximately 100 people for various positions, as well as customer care and restaurant maintenance staff. So the move is part of the corporation's broad strategy to extend its reach to Hanoi and the northern market in the coming time. Now, in terms of what we can say, the uh, work suite that will be involved, of course. What they can enjoy is what we can say a good work environment in terms of um, the benefits, flexible scheduling and fun work environment, which is suitable for millennials who are born between 1986 and 2000. Right, so a very big growth you can expect from McDonald's in Hanoi. So far, I said eight earlier, but actually there are 16 current outlets in Ho Chi Minh since 2014 when the first McDonald's opened. But you could see the design and the structure of the cafes and restaurants. It's very European French-like according to the concept of Vietnam and its tradition. And so you can expect perhaps huge crowds as you see here, more and more people curious about what's going on in the fast food scene. But you know, in addition to McDonald's, there are also presences of other fast food chains making their way into Vietnam, a young country, you could say. And in addition to McDonald's, we mentioned KFC, for mm. example, opening up much earlier than McDonald's. Back in 1997, the first KFC opened after the country's relations normalized with the United States. And from then, about, f you know, several decades later, two in particular, 58 shops are now present in Ho Chi Minh City. Still trailing behind a lot of Asian chains, but still, that's quite a presence. That's right. So besides American franchises or chains, there's also other type of franchises from Asia, as you mentioned. From South Korea, Lotteria, which is an American-style Asian fast food chain, has entered into Vietnam since 1998. And the chain has a total of 84 shops in Ho Chi Minh City as of August 2017. Now, not only that, from the Philippines, Jollibee has arrived well arrived in Vietnam in 1996 as well and started franchising at the end of 2015 so it currently has 98 stores in Vietnam as of July this year right so far Jollibee has big plans as well they plan to expand to 300 stores in Vietnam within the next three years so that's a very ambitious plan indeed but them Jollibee together with partner Viet Thai International they plan to list 
go even further than that. They're going to list their JV Superfoods that owns Highlands Coffee as well as Pho 24 on the stock exchange of Vietnam by 2019, that's in two right. years. That's right. But not only fast food joints are going into Vietnam, but also Starbucks as well, the world's largest coffee house company, of course, made its first foray into Vietnam in 2013. And this year, 2017, the chain has a total of 20 stores in Ho Chi Minh City and eight stores in Hanoi. So in an effort to attract more customers, of course, Starbucks has come out with a brand new concept for its store in Hanoi to improve customer experience as well. So we can see that there is like a lot of, we can say, interest in franchising and of course, um, you know, all these companies coming into Vietnam, specifically Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi, as it is an emerging market for these companies. And with all these companies stepping in and making their brands known to locals and to the international community of ASEAN alike, it seems that the scene is going to become more and more competitive in the near future around Vietnam, around neighboring countries, around ASEAN altogether. With more consumer awareness of this kind of fast food chain, the American food and beverage style, we can expect more and more presences of other brands to follow suit. In addition to McDonald's, KFC, Jollibee, Loteria, for example, we could see more and more presence of Carl's Jr., mm. Pizza Hut, even Thailand's pizza company, Domino's Pizza, and much, much more coming in. Baskin Robbins, Coffee Bean, and Tea Leaf even. That's right. So in terms of the market itself for the food and beverage industry, we can see that it's very strongly developing and it has an expectation to grow by 61.6 percent between 2012 to 2017 within these past few years here and nearly 50 percent of the household expenditure is of course food and beverage so franchising is a common strategy that companies choose when expanding internationally however of the leading 10 food franchise brands only two own more than 50 percent of the outlets and in 2008 as well Burger King King owned 12% of its outlets, but the number fell to 0.4% by 2013, and as well as Subway, the American sandwich company, of course, does not own any outlets, according to the ITA or the International Trade Administration. This trend, you can say, where countries are are the target of a lot of expansion of American franchisees and Asian franchisees as well could also reflect the growing economy and the strength of the backbone of the country's economy. So we'll keep you posted on more developments coming from where the trends are going and which countries. ใช่ค่ะมาดูกันในส่วนแรกค่ะอาเซียนอะราวด์ดัสนะคะหรือยังที่หลายคนน่าจะรู้จักกันดีนะคะแมคโดนัลด์ส์นั่นเองค่ะ
การเจริญเติบโตของวงการอาหารนั่นเองซึ่งเราก็คงจะคาดหวังได้เยอะนะคะว่าจะมีการ expand ของ McDonald มากกว่านี้เพราะว่าปัจจุบันในเมืองโคจิมินนั้นก็มีสาขาประมาณ16สาขาแล้วนะคะ McDonald ก็นับว่ายังขยายไปเรื่อยๆใช่ค่ะก็ถือว่าเป็นข่าวดีสําหรับใครที่อยู่ฮานอยนะคะสามารถที่จะไม่ต้องไปฮาโคจิมินละถ้าจะไปกินแมคโดนัลส์นะคะเพราะว่าเปิดสาขาที่ฮานอยเป็นที่เรียบร้อยละใช่ค่ะซึ่งเราก็จะจับตาดูนะคะว่าจะมีโครงการอื่นจากที่ไหนมาเปิดอีกบ้างไม่ว่าจะเป็นเคาส์จูเนียร์เบอร์เกอร์คิงหรือว่าพิซซ่าฮัทมีอีกเยอะแยะเลยนะคะไม่ว่าจะเป็นดังเกนโดนัทส์คอฟฟี่บีนแอนด์ทีลีฟสตาร์บัคก็ด้วยค่ะสตาร์บัคก็เปิดเรียบร้อยแล้วเช่นเดียวกันอ๋อก็ถือว่าเป็นอีกหนึ่งประเทศที่ใครที่อยากจะลงทุนโดยเฉพาะด้านอาหารแล้วก็เครื่องดื่มนะคะก็เป็นหนึ่งสถานที่ที่ประเทศที่น่าสนใจเลยทีเดียวใช่ค่ะ so there you go another alternative if you're looking for something different other than local food in Vietnam Hanoi Ho Chi Minh we'll keep you posted on more trends coming from ASEAN coming from Vietnam and much much more but now it's time for a short break when we come back hot topics ahead stay tuned พักกันสักครู่ค่ะ Welcome back to the program. Into ASEAN hot issues, lots of news to discover and to update over the last week and beyond, though. But starting off in the Philippines, lots of news coming up as a trial drug has created some backfiring as a result of the ongoing dengue situation in the Philippines. That's right. So this medication that we're talking about here is a dengue vaccination, which is called Dengvaxia, and the Philippines has ordered a probe on Monday, December 4th, into the immunization of more than 730,000 children with dengue, this dengue vaccine, which has since been suspended. While this company here, it's a French drug company, uh, they say that there have been no deaths reported as a result of the program so far. Now, dengue, of course, as we know, is a mosquito-borne disease. Although it is not as serious as, serious as malaria, it is spreading rapidly in many parts of the world, and it can kill people, of course. It's killed 20,000 people a year and infecting hundreds of millions of people. Right, there are always two sides to the coin, it seems, in the effort and attempt to find a proper vaccine. There are always some kind of backfiring or backlash. According to spokesman for President Rodrigo Duterte, they announced the government will actually step in and hold accountable those responsible for this particular program that placed thousands of lives at risk. The program involves the French drug company Sanofi, and apparently lots of people had been at risk of death, but so far no, none have been reported. That's right. So more than 730,000 children aged 9 and over in the Philippines have received one dose of the vaccine as part of a program that cost 3.5 billion pesos or approximately $69.54 million. Now, the Department of Justice has ordered the National Bureau of Investigation to look into the alleged danger to the public health and if evidence so warrants to file appropriate charges thereon. So this is Is what the spokesperson has said and of course they say that you know the government will hold accountable those responsible for the program that had placed thousands of lives at risk right and we'll update you on the situation as the government continues to investigate what's going on behind this program ใช่ละค่ะมาดูกันในส่วนข่าวแรกอาเซียนฮอตอิชชูค่ะไปกันที่ประเทศฟิลิปปินส์กันนะคะซึ่งทางรัฐบาลฟิลิปปินส์ค่ะก็ได้มีคําสั่งให้บริษัทยาที่มีชื่อว่าซานโอฟีนั่นเองค่ะผู้ผลิตยารายใหญ่ของโลกนะคะจากฝรั่งเศสระงับระงับการจ่ายวัคซีนที่มีชื่อว่าแดงวาเซียนั่นเองค่ะเป็นวัคซีนที่ใช้ไว้ป้องกันไข้เลือดออกนะคะจากไวรัสแดงกีนั่นเองหลังจากที่วัคซีนตัวนี้นะคะก็อาจจะก่อให้เกิดผลข้างเคียงที่ถือว่าร้ายแรงในบางกรณีแต่ก็โชคดีไปว่ายังไม่ถึงขั้นมีรายไหนเสียชีวิตนะคะใช่ค่ะแต่นับว่ามีนักศึกษามีเด็กๆหลายคนมากเลยนะคะเป็น 20,000 คนที่ร่วมโครงการนี้เราก็จะคอยอัปเดตนะคะว่าเป็นยังไงบ้างทีดยาที่ก็เจ็บน่าดูนะคะแต่มาเจอเหตุการณ์แบบนี้ก็คงเจ็บใจด้วยมั้งคะเด็กในฟิลิปปินส์เนี่ยประมาณ7จ็ดแสนกว่าคนเนี่ยได้ฉีดวัคซีนตัวนี้ไปเรียบร้อยแล้วแล้วเพิ่งมาเจอว่ามันอาจจะมีผลที่ร้ายแรงก็เ
ก็โชคดีไปนะคะว่ายังไม่มีการรายงานเรื่องการเสียชีวิตไปก็โชคดีไปว่าเรามารู้แล้วว่ามันมีผลข้างเคียงแบบนี้ก็ควรระงับไว้ก่อนนะคะค่ะเราก็จะติดตามดูนะคะว่าข่าวจะออกมาเป็นยังไงบ้าง We'll keep you posted on those developments Meanwhile let's turn over to see what's happening on a lighter aspect happening in Cambodia. A recent meeting of officials, Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has gone to meet her counterpart in Phnom Penh, meeting Cambodian counterpart Prime Minister Hun Sen earlier Monday for an important meeting to discuss many issues, including problems involving the Rohingya migrants. That's right. So they did, of course, meet together in order to strengthen their bilateral cooperation. And it was a three-day visit to the Peace Palace in Cambodia. The two leaders had also witnessed the signing ceremony of nine memoranda of understanding and one agreement covering cooperations in terms of tourism, agriculture, and technology as well. A very productive meeting indeed. Talking about much uh, hot topics indeed, including a joint press conference they held to discuss and answer questions following the issue of the Rohingya crisis that has been ongoing for quite some time with more than half a million Rohingya Muslims fleeing Myanmar over to Bangladesh they created somewhat of a heavy responsibility for the host country and a lot of strain on aid sources and agencies and so a lot has been discussed for assistance as well in this particular issue but uh, with that said Hasina also engaged in business dialogue too on another aspect with the Cambodian Chamber of Commerce and then joined an official dinner later. That's right. มาดูกันต่อนะคะข่าวจากบางกลาเทศกับกัมพูชานั่นเองนะคะเกี่ยวกับความสัมพันธ์ของทั้งสองประเทศนี้ค่ะซึ่งทางซิกฮาซีนานะคะนายกรัฐมนตรีหญิงของบางกลาเทศก็ได้เดินทางไปเยือนกัมพูชาอย่างเป็นทางการนะคะก็ในการต้อนรับในครั้งนี้นะคะก็ต้อนรับดีค่ะมีการประชุมมีการรับประทานอาหารกันนอกนี้นอกเหนือจากนี้นะคะก็มีการเซ็นลงนามข้อตกลงร่วมมือหลายรายการเลยทีเดียวนะคะครอบคลุมด้านการค้าเศรษฐกิจแล้วก็วิชาการด้วยค่ะก็ถือว่าเป็นความสัมพันธ์ของสองประเทศที่กำลังแน่นแฟนกันพอดีนะคะใช่ค่ะนับว่าทั้งสองประเทศก็มีเป็นเป็นพันธมิตรที่ดีมากขึ้นเรื่อยๆนะคะ and we'll keep you posted on more meetings and among diplomats and leaders of various countries but still in Cambodia we take a look at another event that's happening just recently where Prime Minister Hun Sen held a two-day ceremony at the famed Angkor Wat, almost like a merit-making ceremony with his wife, where he prayed and asked for stability and peace in Cambodia. That's right. So this event here occurred on December 3rd, and in which they, of course, invited several monks in order to come, and they had a praying ceremony, 5,000 monks to be exact, to come in so that it could be like a nationwide prayer ceremony for prosperity and good luck as well. Now, the move follows a visit by Hun Sen to Cambodia's main ally, China, and comes as the veteran leader is under fire from Western donors for a crackdown on the opposition party, as there might be some ongoing conflicts or some fire in there. But however, in terms of you know peace and prosperity, of course, merit making is always good. Definitely reflects well on the leaders as well. So with that said, it's very a very tight and you could say tough time for Hun Sen at the moment with the campaign election trail and elections themselves happening very soon. There's big changes happening in Cambodia. That's right. So we can expect to see an election occurring next year, of course. Right. But however, as you mentioned, in terms of politics and lots of things going on in terms of change as well, the opposition party was in September charged with treason for alleged plot to take over power with American help, of course. So that's on the political side of things. But now, as we can see on screen at the moment, the footage there, this is the merit-making ceremony that occurred in Cambodia on December 3rd. Right, perhaps such a colorful and merit meritorious event like this could offset a lot of the tensions going on, whether it's in politics, whether it's between bilateral relations with the U.S., for example, and even China. So, lovely dancing indeed. ใช่ละค่ะมาดูกันต่อนะคะยังอยู่ที่ประเทศกัมพูชากันค่ะซึ่งทางสมเด็จฮุนเซนนะคะก็ได้จัดพิธีทําบุญประเทศครั้งยิ่งใหญ่นะคะที่ปราสาทนครวัดเพื่อความสงบสุขและความมั่นคงของบ้านเมืองนั่นเองค่ะท่ามกลางความขัดแย้งทางการเมืองภายในกัมพูชาแต่ว่าใน
ที่เราเห็นกันในขณะนี้นะคะก็เป็นการทําบุญระดับประเทศเลยทีเดียวซึ่งมีการนิมนต์พระสงฆ์จากทั่วประเทศมารวมมากกว่า 5,000 รูปนั่นเองนะคะก็มีการสวดมนต์ขออภัยค่ะสวดมนต์ค่ะเพื่อสันติภาพแล้วก็สถิรภาพและความมั่นคงของบ้านเมืองค่ะค่ะการเป็นการทําบุญที่ยิ่งใหญ่ทีเดียวนะคะนับว่าเป็นการจัดพิธีที่อยู่ช่วงระหว่างมีการตรึงตรึงนะคะ,คะระหว่างสองประเทศไม่ว่าจะเป็นทางสหรัฐอเมริกานะคะเรื่องฝ่ายการค้านใช่ไหมคะของการเมืองแล้วก็ประเทศจีนเช่นกันนะคะเราก็จะคอยจับตาดูว่าจะมีกิจกรรมอะไรต่อไปจากประเทศแคมปูชานั่นเองค่ะ but speaking of China and its relationship in terms of Cambodia of course the Chinese president has met with the Cambodian leader As well, Chinese President Xi Jinping has met in Beijing on Friday with President of Cambodia's People's Party and Cambodian Prime Minister Somdet t e k Hun Sen, and Eng, in which Hun Sen was in Beijing in order to attend the Communist Party of China or the CPC in dialogue with the World Political Party's high-level meeting, which occurred November 30th to December 3rd. Right, coming up in 2018, this marks a very important year for both Cambodia and China, considering the two countries themselves at their best and closest bilateral relations so far. 2018 marks the 60th anniversary of their diplomatic ties. Both countries' leaders say they're actually quite good friends with each other, and they say that. Political trust has been enhanced. Cooperation and cultural exchange has been expanded. So currently, the ties are at their best. That's right. So according to C, he has said that the CPC and the Chinese government always views China Cambodia ties from a strategic height and long term perspective. He also said that Cambodia always firmly supports China on issues concerning its core interests. Now, C also expressed support for Cambodia's efforts to maintain development and stability. Adding that China expects to boost cooperation with Cambodia in defense, law enforcement, and security, as well as other areas. Mm, not to mention stronger bilateral coordination in multilateral mechanisms, in, for example, the United Nations, the East Asia Cooperation, and also l a n g k a n g Mekong cooperation efforts as well. So, from this meeting, we can deduce that lots of, you could say, those bonds have been strengthened. That's right. So that's good news indeed in terms of Hun Sen's side. He also had to say some say about the relationship. Of course, he also thinks that the relationship is at its peak point. He also congratulated C on his re-election as General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee and spoke highly of the dialogue between the CPC and the world political parties as well. They called China trustworthy and close friends of Cambodia. Indeed, and we'll keep you posted on more developments coming from these two friendly countries. ใช่แล้วค่ะมาดูกันในส่วนความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างสองประเทศจีนกับกัมพูชานั่นเองนะคะซึ่งทางประธานาธิบดีสีจิ้นผิงค่ะก็ได้พบหารือกับสมเด็จฮุนเซนนายกรัฐมนตรีของกัมพูชาค่ะก็ถือว่าเป็นการประชุมกันเพื่อเพื่อกระชับความสัมพันธ์ของทั้งสองประเทศนั่นเองนะคะซึ่งทางประธานาธิบดีสีจิ้นผิงเนี่ยก็ได้กล่าวกับฮุนเซนว่าชื่นชมการพัฒนาการความสัมพันธ์ของทั้งสองประเทศนะคะแล้วก็ได้รู้สึกว่าในช่วงนี้ถือว่าเป็นปีที่ดีที่สุดในความสัมพันธ์ของทั้งสองประเทศเลยทีเดียวค่ะผู้นำสองประเทศก็ออกมาประกาศว่าเป็นเพื่อนที่ดีต่อกันละกันนะคะปีหน้าเองก็เป็นปีที่สําคัญสําหรับสองประเทศซึ่งก็เป็นปีที่ฉลองความเป็นพันธมิตรนะคะ60ปีก็นับว่าเป็นการเพิ่มความพันธมิตรที่หนาแน่นมากขึ้นนะคะ That's right. And moving on to some lighter news updates now. Now, if you remember, of course, not too long ago we had a super moon, and in which you could see that here in Thailand as well. But we're going to take a look at the super moon in Bali, in which we know the situation in Bali, of course, with the Mount Agung erupting. Of course, now it was a sight to see. We can say in terms of the super moon that occurred, and the last full moon of the year, which occurred on December 4th, turned out to be a super moon and. It was brightening the sky, and in the background, of course, you can see Mount Agung, as we see in the footage here, and you can see some smoke coming out from the volcano as well. Wow! Whoever got to take photos of that will have amazing photos to reflect on and remember and reminisce about. It was a really beautiful super moon right there. That's right. So it is a beautiful view, of course, but despite you know the fact that it was so beautiful, it's still erupting, and it's something that authorities have still warned that you. Know, There's possibility of another major eruption, or a major eruption, not another one, but a major eruption could happen. So 
it's still in warning, of course, for those of you who want to travel to Bali, that Mount Agung is still in its warning. Right, indeed. Well, with that said, shedding light more on the smoke and the spew going on, you could th say that it's been a long time, though, that the, the, the volcano is still remaining undecided. That's But right. uh, we'll keep you posted as we continue to keep watch on the situation.ที่บาหลีนั่นเองค่ะของอินโดนีเซียนะคะซุปเปอร์มูนหรือว่าดวงจันทร์เต็มดวงใกล้โลกที่สุดปรากฏเหนือภูเขาไฟอากุงนั่น
Today, scientific advances have been made in HIV treatment. There are also laws to protect people living with HIV, and we understand so much more about the condition. But each year, thousands of people are diagnosed with HIV and do not know about the facts or how to protect themselves and others. And the stigma and discrimination remain a reality for many people living with the condition. World AIDS Day is important because it reminds the public and government that HIV has not gone away. There's still a vital need to raise money, increase awareness, fight prejudice, and improve education. So what should we do on World AIDS Day? World AIDS Day is an opportunity to show solidarity with the millions of people living with HIV. So you can order red ribbons through online shops, pick up various promotions to support HIV. You can also order other ribbons to help fundraise AIDS trust funds and foundations. So World AIDS Day is a great opportunity to raise money for the cause, to help champion the rights of people living with HIV. So do contact someone within your country for fundraising information or for more details. You can even host your own event. The 2nd of December 2017, Lao National Day. Every December 2nd in Laos is the country's national day. It is celebrated as a public holiday which commemorates the creation of the Lao People's Democratic Republic in the year of 1975. The holiday provides citizens with the opportunity to celebrate their country's history and their present independence through festivities and a day of rest. The Recent History of Laos Laos is commonly called Mueang Lao. It is a country that is landlocked by Myanmar and China to its northwest, Vietnam to its east, Cambodia to its south, and Thailand to its west. The modern country of Laos is closely connected to the Kingdom of Lan Sang Hom Khao, also known as the Kingdom of Million Elephants under the White Parasol. For about four centuries, this kingdom was one of the largest in Southeast Asia. The kingdom was also a hub for trading as it had a central location in Southeast Asia. This trade helped develop the culture to the region now referred to as Laos. Laos and many neighboring countries saw significant political change during the 20th century. Although the Kingdom of Laos was, during the First Indochina War in 1947, officially proclaimed, the country made steps forward full independence in 1953 as a constitutional monarchy. This decision led to a civil war between the communist political party movement of Patet Lao, or the Lao people, and the royal Lao government. The Laotian civil war lasted more than two decades and included North and South Vietnam, Thailand, and the United States. Although the Paris Peace Accords of 1973 attempted to stop the fighting, the ceasefire was broken in 1975 by the Patet Lao. On December 2nd of that year, the King Savang Watana was forcibly abdicated, allowing for the Lao People's Democratic Republic to be proclaimed. The National Day celebrates this proclamation. With the creation of a republic, Prince Supa Nuong Tao was also sworn into presidency. Celebrating Lao National Day in Laos The National Day in Laos is celebrated extensively across the country. There are numerous parades, some ceremonies, and even formal speeches. These festivities often include the use of red flags bearing a hammer and a sickle. A new flag has also been introduced to the country which includes the colors blue, white and red. The red is meant to symbolize blood that has been shed for the country's independence. Blue symbolizes the country's health, also known as Mekong, and the white disc-shaped emblem on the country's modern flag represents the moon over the Mekong the country's unity under the communist government. You will likely see a number of these flags if you plan to visit Laos during this time. Some of the biggest cities with celebrations for the National Day include Vientiane, the largest city in Laos and its capital. This city is located on the Mekong River. Pasque, this is the second largest city in Laos located in the southern province of Champasak. Sovanakane, also known as Khe Son Pomwihan and previously known as Katabuli, is a city with the third largest in Laos and is the capital of the Sawanakate province. 
Laos is a beautiful country with many large cities and rivers. This Asian country comes with a rich history and a recent secure on a reformed government. Wherever you plan to go on December 2nd while in Laos, you can expect to find some enthusiastic celebration of this part of history that has occurred during the lives of so many citizens. Find yourself a parade and be sure to partake in the celebrations. The 3rd of December 2017, Disability Day. Disability Day or the International Day of People with Disability is a day that has been promoted by the United Nations since 1992. The aim of Disability Day is to encourage a better understanding of people affected by a disability, together with helping to make people more aware of the rights, dignity and welfare of disabled people, as well as raise awareness about the benefits of integrating disabled persons into every aspect of life from economic to political to social and cultural. Disability Day is not concerned exclusively with either mental or physical disability, but rather encompasses all known disabilities, from autism to Down syndrome to multiple sclerosis. The History of Disability Day Everything started in 1976, when the United Nations General Assembly made the decision that 1981 should be the International Year of Disabled Persons. The five years between the making of that decision and the actual year of disabled persons were spent contemplating the hardships of the disabled, how the opportunities of the disabled could be equalized, and how to ensure the disabled take part fully in community life, enjoying all of the rights and benefits non-disabled citizens have. Another issue that was touched on was how world governments could go about preventing disabilities from touching people in the first place. So much of the talk was about the viruses and other illnesses that led to various kinds of disability. The decade between 1983 and 1992 was later proclaimed the United Nations Decade of Disabled Persons. And during that time, all of the concepts previously created became parts of one long process that was implemented in order to improve the lives of disabled persons in the world. How to Celebrate Disability Day each year since 1992, a variety of events are held in many countries. Disability Day is used for holding discussions, forums and campaigns relating to disability, and communities are encouraged to organize meetings, talks and even performances in their local areas. This can range from hosting a musical to a play, with disabled people being involved in these productions. The overall aim is to show non-disabled people that a person with disability can be a vibrant member of society, as it happens that the entirely healthy are not always quite aware of this fact, which can lead to different kinds of discrimination of varying degrees of severity. The disabled, on the other hand, benefit from such performances by providing to themselves that there are many things they can still do, despite their conditions, which can help with their self-esteem and avoid mental issues such as depression from plaguing them. In general, these kinds of events are meant to challenge them and get rid of various stereotypes so that disabled people can enjoy lives free of discrimination and additional hardship. Each year the day is celebrated, there is an emphasis on a new aspect related to improving the lives of people living with disability. In 2007, for example, the theme of the year was Decent Work for Persons with Disabilities. In 2013, it was Break Barriers, Open Doors for an Inclusive Society and Development for All. A call to help disabled people live in an inclusive society in every country and to make sure that society was as accessible as possible for disabled people in all aspects, from making sure buildings are wheelchair accessible to installing braille on elevator buttons. The 4th of December 2017, Thai Environment Day. Thai Environment Day is celebrated on December 4th, it is an official observance that was established in 1991. Although it is not a national holiday, it is widely marked with various events and activities. On December 4, 1989, the late King Pumipon Adunyadeir held a birthday ceremony at the Grand Palace. During the ceremony, he delivered a speech on the problems of the Thai environment. Main environmental issues in Thailand include air pollution, deforestation, 
overfishing, field and forest burning, lack of water resources, water pollution, poaching, and wildlife habitat loss. The late king expressed concern about the future of the country's environment and called on Thai citizens to cooperate in order to solve environmental issues. Two years later, the Ministry of Science, Technology and Environment designated December 4th as Thai Environment Day. Since 2002, the celebration has been coordinated by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment that was created that year. Thai Environment Day focuses on raising awareness of environmental issues. On December 4th, Thai citizens are encouraged to engage in eco-friendly activities. For example, plant a tree or ride a bike instead of using public transportation. The 5th of December 2017 the late King of Thailand's birthday and Father's Day. The late King Pumipon Adunyadet was born on December 5th, and this day is now celebrated as Father's Day across Thailand. Thai people may give a dog putaraksa, also known as a kana flower, to their fathers and grandfathers on this day. Many people also wear yellow, which is the late king's color. This day is also celebrated as National Day. The reverence in which the people of Thailand hold their king cannot be overestimated. Many Thai people will travel to Hua Hin to celebrate the late king's birthday. Countless more will gather throughout the country to give alms to monks in the morning. Note that the Emerald Buddha Temple will be opened on December 5th to the 6th, but the Royal Palace will be closed both days, and the Royal Chapel will be closed on the 5th, but open on the 6th. The King of Thailand in many Western countries, the concept of constitutional monarchy is well understood. The monarch is seen as a symbol of the nation and its continuity, and for this reason, he or she is expected to be above politics and so a representative of all the people in the state. In Western countries, it is understood that this non-political stance does not necessarily make the monarch immune from criticism or even satire. Thailand is a constitutional monarchy as well. But the concept of kingship in Thailand is much stronger and more far-reaching. The Late King Pumipon Adunyade Pumipon Adunyade was born on December 5, 1928 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where his father was studying public health at Harvard. He returned to Bangkok briefly, but in 1933, his mother took him and his brother to Switzerland, where they stayed until the end of the Second World War. Pumipon ascended the throne following the death of his brother on June 9th. 1946. This made the late King Pumipon the world's longest reigning monarch. He returned to Switzerland to complete his studies, leaving an uncle to act as regent in his absence. It was in Switzerland that he met and married his wife, Queen Surikit. Following this, he returned to Thailand where the official coronation ceremony took place on May 5, 1950. He is thus the world's longest serving head of state. This date is celebrated every year in Thailand as Coronation Day, a public holiday. The late King Pumipon Adunyadeh passed away on October 13, 2016. And those were our highlights on ASEAN calendar this week. Time for a short break, though. We'll see you very soon, so stay with us. Welcome back to the show. Into ASEAN interview, we have an interesting topic coming up, talking about the ongoing situation with Mount Agung in Bali continuing to spew smoke all over. Some updates here, some good news. Airlines have now reopened for passengers who have been stranded as well to accept more passengers as well. Ever since the 29th of November, the situation at the airports are almost back to normal after a 72-hour pause and hiatus in the situation 
situation because of the intensity of the smoke and the uncertainty of the volcanic situation. แต่ละการในช่วงอาเซียนอินเทอร์วิวค่ะในวันนี้เราจะไปดูในสถานการณ์ที่เกิดขึ้นในบาหลีนั่นเองค่ะหลังจากที่สนามบินที่บาหลีนั่นเองนะคะก็ได้มีการปิดไปทั้งหมด72ชั่วโมงนะคะเมื่อวันที่29พฤศจิกายนทางสนามบินก็ได้เปิดเป็นที่เรียบร้อยแล้วนะคะหลังจากที่ผู้เขาไฟอากุงนั่นเองค่ะก็ได้มีควันแล้วก็เท่าถาดที่ลอยออกมานั่นเองก็ทําให้ก็นักท่องเที่ยวนะคะที่ใครที่จะไปที่บาหลีเนี่ยก็ต้องระมัดระวังกันเอาเป็นว่าเดี๋ยวเราไปดูกันนะคะว่าสถานการณ์ที่บาหลีเป็นยังไงกันบ้างค่ะฟัมลีส์ฟล็อกต์ทูเทมเพอร์เรย์เชลเตอร์สในบาหลีส์แคปิตอลเดนบาซาร์ล็อกเกตต์ส์ฟาร์ส์70กิโลเมตรจากที่อารับติงมอนต์อากุงวอลเคโนในเดือนก Over 200 people camped out in a sports hall, watched television to pass the time and to distract themselves from worrying about their future and their loved ones who decided to stay behind to tend to livestock. Many men also stayed back in order to help as volunteers. The National Disaster Mitigation Agency said about 43,000 people heeded advice to take shelter after a 10-kilometer exclusion zone was imposed. But with an estimated population of 90,000 to 100,000 in the danger zone, many had not. Agung looms over eastern Bali to a height of just over 3,000 meters. That's around 9,800 feet. Its last major eruption in 1963 killed more than a thousand people and razed many villages. December is usually the peak season for tourism in Bali. But this current December has seen deserted beaches, empty restaurants and hotels on the Indonesian island tourist resort, all because of the volcanic eruptions on Mount Agung. The Jimboran Beach used to be an ideal setting for gourmet tourists of fresh seafood at sunset. Most restaurants and grill bars target Chinese as well as Western tourists. But right now, with most volcanic eruptions stranded Chinese tourists having departed, What are left behind are just stacks of chairs and dinner tables on empty beach sands. Downtown restaurants fared no better. A popular halal restaurant is now emptied after most stranded Chinese tourists had left on chartered flights. This emptiness deals a heavy blow to this restaurant since its opening. According to figures available from the Chinese Consulate General in Bali, Over 13,960 Chinese nationals have left the tourist island resort on chartered flights between November 29th and December 3rd. And what's more, three Chinese airlines have cancelled their December tourist flights to Bali from various Chinese cities. Though the absence of Chinese tourists have not affected the mood of local Indonesian holidaymakers, the stay away of the Chinese could impact greatly the Bali tourism industry. Local Bali tour operators have combined to accommodate a planned arrival of up to 1.2 million Chinese tourists and visits centering around the December-January season. But the latest bout of cancellation is sure to affect the tourism industry on the island for at least this winter. Bali Airport has reopened for two days, but some tourists are still struggling to leave the holiday island. On Friday, as of December 1st, we have already lost our flight to to Singapore, and we have a flight to Portugal to come back to our country, uh, and we already lost that flight, and they don't give us answer. I asked uh, five minutes ago for an answer for if they have some place for us to sleep, and they don't have nothing to us, you know, and we are we don't know. We're going to live in the airport more one or two days. They don't give an answer if we have space in the next flight or something. Uh, we booked three different flights and they're all cancelled. And hoping today to leave now to go to Kuala Lumpur to go to Australia. I, I love Bali, but I have small children at home that are getting minded by their grandchildren. I have a three-year-old and two girls, and I need to get home to my children. So I was only here for a four-day wedding, and now I've, I need to get home. I can't be here for two weeks. Jetstar and its parent Qantas Airways Limited had planned up to 18 flights on Friday to ferry 4,300 passengers home to Australia, including one via Qantas 747 jet. But nine Jetstar flights, 
will be cancelled after the sudden change. And that was the situation going on in Bali. With that said, we're going to end the program for this week, and we'll see you next week. As for now, สวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะ